Hello everyone, welcome to the RM Sotheby's Car Show. Here I am from a, uh, a marquee in the grounds of Marlborough House in London and uh, we're here for our London auction, of course, surrounded by incredible cars. And we are here with this episode's special guest. We have Sam Fain. Sam, welcome. And uh, Sam, if you don't know the name Sam Fain, then you might know the name Seen Through Glass. Uh, and do people, are you a bit like Elton John? I mean, do you like to go by Elton or, or Dwight? Uh, no, what's Elton John's real name? Does anyone know? Do you, <laughs> it's, it's, does, does anybody call Sting by his real name? I didn't know he had a real Gordon. name. Gordon. His name's Gordon. Oh, Gordon. Gordon. No wonder he changed it to Sting. Gordon Sumner. Yeah. That's no. right, isn't it? I'm do people call mad, you Seen or? Yeah. Or they, I mean, I, I will, be, like, you're slightly mocking, but. <laughs> Mr. In, Glass. STG. STG actually has become a thing, which, you know what, I didn't fight it. I was like, sure, I'll go with that. So, um, uh, yeah, I get a lot of different things. Usually it's a, hey, are you seen through glass? And I'm like, I guess. <laughs> um, and where so, did the name come from, Sam? I'm fascinated yeah. by that. It's a super weird one. When I started this whole YouTube venture, mm. uh, my initial idea was to walk around with something called Google Glass. It was right. a product from Google that they, it was like a prototype. It was a pair of spectacles oh, that yes. you could interact with. So you could walk around and say, hey Google, film this. Or yeah. hey Google, call Bob or whatever it might be. And so I thought I would just walk around the streets of London and go, hey Google, take a picture of cars that I saw. Uh, then I found out Google Glass was about a thousand pounds. Never worked, and I was yeah, like, yeah. oh. But I developed all the branding materials. So I was like, okay, I can stick with this. So it developed into seen through the glass of a windscreen, yeah. seen through the glass of a camera lens, mm. and, and I just rolled with it. So Great, that's where it came from. It stuck. Yeah, it stuck. Somehow yeah. it stuck, and it's worked. But uh, yeah, so I, you know, I am Sam. Sam from Seen Through Glass, STG, Mister Seen Through Glass, whatever it might be. Well, but. and do you get recognised? I mean, do you, you know, have you been walking down, have you just walked out of Boots having bought some paracetamol and somebody's gone, oh, it's you! <laughs> just my mum. <laughs> um, strangely, yes. Uh, and actually, it happens way more than I ex ever expect that it should, you know. Okay, if I go to a good breakfast meet, mm. that's my audience. If I don't get recognised now, yeah. I'm probably doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Fair, <laughs> um, fair but yeah, just walking out of Boots, you don't expect it and there have been some super strange places where people have come up and said, hey, I watched the channel. Okay, so Sam, um, let's just go a little bit back in time. How, when you were at school, and you know, you're doing your GCSEs, were you saying to your teachers, I'm gonna be a YouTuber? <laughs> no, YouTube, what, what, what it was wasn't a thing. <laughs> no, well, no, that's fair comment. And it definitely wasn't when I was doing my O-levels, not my GCSEs. Um, so, go on, talk us through it, how did it happen? Uh, it's a very, it's a bit of a long-winded story that I'll try and make very uh, concise. So, originally wanted to be a Formula One driver. Of course, obviously. No money, no talent, so ran out of options. Um, went to music was my other great love. So I left okay. school wanting to be in the music industry. So I floated around, you know, trying to be in bands, trying to work at record labels and things like that for a few years. Didn't quite work out and ended up in PR. Mm. So it was quite a wide breadth of PR. And I loved that, and I did that for about five or six years, and I thought, right, I need to move my career on a bit. I'll go and be freelance, do my own thing, and maybe I can get some Formula One clients for PR. I was like, oh, what a full circle yeah. way of life. And after about six to nine months, I was just bored. I, I didn't have enough clients, I didn't know what to do with myself. And my dad was the one who said, find yourself a hobby that can distract yourself when you're not that busy. And my hobby was always making videos. I always loved making videos. And then my other great passion was, was motorsport or was cars. Mm. And at the time, Instagram was just kind of blowing up for street supercar photography. Right. Something which now I, can, I guess us car enthusiasts are very mm. familiar with. Mm. Here in London, every summer, every great supercar is driving from Mayfair to Knightsbridge. Yeah. You see them all. But when I was starting Seen Through Glass, it was quite a new thing, 2015, 2014, 2015. And uh, my route to work was uh, through Knightsbridge and Mayfair. So I worked out that I was seeing a lot of cars that these street spotters weren't seeing because it was on the way to work and things like that. So I thought, I'll take some photos, I'll take some videos of them, upload them, and if it earns me 100 quid a month, great. Happy yeah. days. Um, you know, it's a good distraction from my quite boring day job. <laughs> Do you like, by the way, I'm just going to, ask a question. Do you like being called an influencer? Where do you stand on all of this? Do you, do you think of yourself, if you say to people in the pub, what, if, you, if you describe what you do, what do you tell I them? Say I'm a, I say I'm a YouTuber. A YouTuber. I, I, influencer is a really tough one because it's become 
the generic term for mm. anyone who creates content online. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's so many variations of that. You can be an Instagrammer, a YouTuber, a TikToker, yeah. a blogger. But as it's become more of a uh, regarded pr profession, mm. uh, influencer is a more acceptable term. But uh, that carries with it certain connotations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm sure, uh, maybe I was going to say maybe auctioneers is too broad for maybe you guys. I don't know, but it, there's two influencers tends to sort of suggest 19 year old yoga latte with yeah, yeah. 2000 followers in Dubai yeah. talking about her breakfast smoothie, which look yeah. fine. Super cool. You talk about Super coffee fair. a lot though, to be fair. <laughs> oh, yeah, to be fair, <laughs> I'm such an influencer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I use the term if I'm in a pitch meeting because a marketing manager will go, yeah, sure, influencer. But I tend to present myself as, yeah, a YouTuber or yeah. a creator. It started as a hobby, as just a way for me to indulge in being a car nerd. Mm. And it's now so much more than that. And I'm indulging in, yeah, the cinematography side of it and, and so many other elements of my life that I'm passionate about. Mm. Uh, and it's become a business. So I, I also have to think of it differently than just a, a hobby or a passion project. But what I'm more blown away by is even three years ago, mm. sitting down with friends, let alone companies and individuals, and trying to convince them that what I did was actually a real thing <laughs> and a job or had value to me or anyone else yes. was super hard. Where nowadays, I think most kids in this country, mm. certain age groups, they all, if you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, they all say YouTuber yeah. or influencer, which yeah. is insane. So that's blown my mind more, mm. less so my own uh, journey has been the yeah the growth of social media and being a professional sure. influencer. When, when did you realise that you could actually make a living out of it? I mean, uh, I mean, when when did, when did you say, mm, okay, maybe this isn't just a hobby. This actually is my day job. It was it was about nine months in. I went on a big trip with a, another huge guy within my space called Shmi One Hundred and Fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's been doing it much longer than I have. And at that time, maybe he had. 350,000 subscribers, but he was doing it professionally. Mm. And we spent a, a couple of weeks in Monaco with a few other lads, and I saw how they run their, ran their channels as businesses. Yeah. I was like, all right. <laughs> it's definitely more than I charged my client last <laughs> month, so it looks good. And uh, so I went home and I analyzed it. At that point, from about a year worth of videos, I'd probably made 750 quid, something like that. Yeah. So I was like, this is, I can't, I, you know, this is, I can't quit the job today, but I made a whole plan of like how I could transition from, yeah, PR freelancer uh, into, into a YouTuber, so. I mean, cars are clearly your passion. It comes across really well on your channel, I think. And, and you are clearly an enthusiast, first and foremost. Do you find that the longer you're in it and the, and the more exposure you have to all the events, to everything you see, all the cars that surround you, do you become slightly blasé and slight, does it slightly dumb down and muddy the water for you in terms of your passion, your enthusiasm for cars versus your business? One million percent. It's actually the, the saddest part about working in something you're passionate about. You know, I think there's a lot of people that say never make your hobby your job or the other way around. You know, yeah. you want to love what you do, mm -hmm. but sometimes you don't want to cross those boundaries. So. Where, where I've eventually ended up is for me, it's all about stories now. Sure. So, you know, that Chiron Supersport that's behind us, mm. unbelievable car, mm. super rare, super incredible. And five years ago, I wouldn't be talking to you both. <laughs> I'd be taking <laughs> photos. You'd be, you'd be licking it screen, yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't want to leave. <laughs> where, when I first saw it yesterday, when I came to some of these cars being loaded in, I was like, cool, Chiron Supersport. Like, mm. And that kills me a bit. Mm. Whereas yeah. if that car had an intrinsic story that it was featured here or the owner took it there and there are some great examples of that in this room I, I think the Enzo has 70,000 odd kilometers on the clock yeah. that for me makes it the car in the room like yeah. I'm obsessed with that because I want to know everywhere it went and what mm. it did and mm. why it, like so that's what excites me is, yeah. is the stories and learning the stories uh, the cars themselves unfortunately mm. you do just become a little bit yeah, yeah I think blase. that's true for us as well it, isn't it, it I mean really we, we we love what we do but we do live and breathe it you know, seven days a week. So yeah. you, 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 you know, I, it's funny, somebody was talking to me uh, about Top Gear TV okay. show. And I said, well, I actually haven't watched Top Gear for years okay. because w when, I'm at sitting, when I'm sitting on my sofa with a, maybe with a glass of wine, 
uh, I actually need to remove myself from automobiles. I need to. You know, it's weird. I'm I not there to... yet. I mean, <laughs> you're a little bit older than me. Uh, I'm still there at home, what? relaxing, watching car crap car on content. YouTube. I yeah. don't know why, but I do find it relaxing. I think it's because it enables me to separate myself watching someone else do something different. And going back to that point you made about the stories, I think that is what motivates me more than anything else about this job, is finding the individual histories of these cars. Mm. I mean, take the little Morgan out there, for example. It's probably the cheapest car in the auction. But it did the RAC rally in 1952 and 1953. And that kind of element to these vehicles just makes it for me. And unearthing those stories, getting it out there to people, exposing it and, and sharing what is an individual wonderful history is, mm. is what it's all about. And it's that kind of threshold level, isn't it? You know, we're spoiled where we get to be around these cars all the time. Yeah. But if I said to, I'm sure, either of you or to myself, okay, well actually that Super Sport needs to be delivered to Milan next week and you've got to drive it, yeah. I'm fairly certain we'd all be very excited. So whilst we might not have been really buzzing to see it get loaded off a truck and into a beautiful marquee, uh, it's about, yeah, that threshold. And, Years ago, I just wouldn't see these cars and that yes. would excite me. Now yeah. I've seen them, I want to drive them. For us in this world, we're, um, you know, we, a, a lot of what we love and, and a lot of the stuff we sell, you know, it, it is older stuff. You know, I, I know we're surrounded by a lot of quite modern supercars and hypercars today, but you know, we have, you know, we're selling pre-war cars, cars from the 50s. And, and the, you know, there's a lot of amazing, a lot of amazing old cars. A lot of those cars have got amazing histories. And it's a, it, it kind of people need to be educated, don't they? Because you, you might love modern Ferraris and Porsches, um, but actually, if you if you could actually just get a bit of exposure to uh, something from the 1950s, uh, it, it, you know, that's and that's how people grow the passion, isn't it? And and this is exactly, and I think also it comes down to, uh, you know. Obviously, I'm not a professional. I never trained to do this, so it, it does all come from just a, an enthusiast point of view. And you know, this room is a perfect example, right? Uh, with my YouTube head on, the Chiron Super Sport is probably the car that's going to get the most views. Yeah. yeah, probably. However, aside from me telling you that's a Chiron Super Sport, I'd have to read a few pages of. Well, I, like, I can't tell you much. Okay, it's like a 300 plus one, and it goes yeah. really fast, and it's orange and black, and I'm like, I kind of run out of things to say now. <laughs> Where the 550 Barquetta, yeah. no one on the internet will care about that car, yeah. but I could talk for about two hours about it. And <laughs> so for me, yeah. it is far easier for me to walk in this room yeah. and film a, a really in-depth video and a video that I'm proud of and that I know I'm going to be passionate in about a car that maybe no one will care about. Mm than sitting here slaving and sweating and worrying that I'm getting facts wrong and having to Google things. So that's the, the maybe the lazy part of me, I don't know, but or at least the selfish part of me where I'd far rather indulge in those things that I'm confident about yeah. than have to force a little bit of fakeness and try and, you know, yeah, pretend that something just to get views because, sure. you know, it, it's just going to be killer for everyone where yeah. mm. there are better people mm. to do a walk around in that car and tell you about it th than me. Yeah. Um, so come, come and watch my 550 Barquetta <laughs> review instead. <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you know about your audience? Uh, so when I was a magazine journalist, you would, go, you would do a story, you would sit at a computer, you would write it, and then next week um, it's in WH Smith on a shelf. And actually you've got no idea whether anyone liked it or not. There was not, you know, okay, a magazine has a letters page, you know, Mr. Angry from St. Albans saying, that I've just read Pete Haynes' article on whatever, and it was absolutely dreadful. Um, so you get, you know, there was a little bit of feedback, but, um, and everything I wrote was dreadful, by the way, uh, which is why, that's why my, journal like my, video. Like my journalism career was very short. Um, but you, you're obviously having what I think must be really nice in the world we live in today is that you, you know, you do something today in a few hours, you're getting lots of feedback, you're getting lots of comments, you've got, and you've got this dialogue day. So that must be quite interesting for you. Yeah, nice, nice isn't the word that I would choose. Oh, yes, I, <laughs> I suppose that, are they very quick? Are they very quick to tell you that they love something and also very quick to tell you that that was absolutely awful? Yes, uh, <laughs> a, 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 and not just the audience. You know, social media is a cruel beast because well, yeah. uh, mm, it yeah. tells you through a number of ways. I mean, YouTube as an example, when you upload a video, within the first hour, it tells you how that video is performing out of one to ten of your last ten videos. Right. So you live your life on that stat. 
the one out of 10, three out of 10, six out of 10. Yeah. And when you see a nine or a 10 out of 10, everything drains from your body because you're like, why? It says, your video is underperforming. Thanks, YouTube. Um, <laughs> but then also, if you get a, a one out of 10, as in your video is flying, it's the best video that's performed on the channel for months, mm. you can open up the comment section and you'll read the first five comments. This is the best video I've filmed. I love this video. Yeah. Sam, you're killing it. The fifth comment is, music was crap. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> Uh, what is that about YouTube and music? I mean, are they going to sort that out one day? Well, I mean, the music is tough because copyright, but it, just in general, it's, it's those little digs or bites of whatever it could be. Yeah. Or, or you said it was 304 miles an hour. It's actually 304.25. Yeah, oh, you're yes. not a real car guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you read all of them, you're, you're opening yourself up to that exposure. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter. You, know, you, you develop a very thick skin yeah. and you have to laugh at a lot of these comments. But it can't help, you know, when you're in a creative industry, and I'm sure, you know, that, that one, uh, you know, yeah. reader feedback, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, people's yeah. article was crap. It, it does really sting. And so it's great because it helps you, yeah, could tell what you're doing slightly. And if you get five videos where they go, Sam, you're going in a weird direction here. We don't like this. Cool. Get the idea. Okay. Um, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt. And in yeah. general, it's, it's, it's great. And especially with the variety of content I try and create, it's really good to know what people are enjoying and what they're not yeah. enjoying. And for me, comments are everything. If right. a video gets 10,000 views or 100,000 views, I base it all on the comments. Really? As long as the comments are good. Yeah. Because, you know, if it can be so many other factors that decide how many people actually end up seeing it. Yes. You know, so if it's 10,000 people, but every single comment is, I love this video, it's been fantastic, cool. Yeah. Fine. Just hasn't got the shareability that I thought. Maybe I got the title wrong. Yeah. Maybe the mm. thumbnail. Maybe I uploaded it at the wrong time. Maybe there was a Grand Prix. Maybe there was an auction everyone was tuned into watching. <laughs> like, you know, you never know what those outside factors might be. Yeah. So I focus wholly on the comments and try and look past the ones that just, this edit yeah. was awful. <laughs> oh, but I, it, it's interesting. I don't know what you think, Will, because, you know, we move with the times at RM Sotheby's, um, uh, we try to, and obviously in the last few years we've, we now produce an awful lot more uh, video content than, than we ever would have done historically going back a few years. And um, we, you know, we, we produce a lot and I sometimes go onto YouTube and look at the hit numbers and for, for different films and I find it fascinating as to the films that do well and the films that, you know, a hundred people have watched and nobody and because you, you, I'm constantly um, proved wrong in the sense that I think this 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 little bit of content's going to be everyone's going to love this and it bombs yeah. and then you stick something else up there that you think is quite dull and yeah. isn't and and and, you know, and it flies yeah. yeah and it's really I find I'm finding it impossible to try and work it out but I think the biggest thing is as, as social media has grown that people have forgotten or got lost in is the numbers right? Because we all get used to seeing these sort of stupid numbers. YouTubers out there who have 50 million subscribers and videos with 100 million views. Okay, so you might have a video that gets 100 views, but all it takes is one person who wants to buy what's behind me, an RS, mm. and he's done it. He's, he's been looking for the video, he's found the video and, and yeah. gone. And, and I think we're all too quick to judge comparatively. Yes. Uh, and especially mm. comparatively with your own content, but also other people's content and, and you know, you forget about the, the credibility and the engagement factor and, yeah. and who that audience is. Yeah. So I'm with you, I, it kills me. I'm always like, oh, this is the worst video I've filmed in months, it flies. Yeah. And the one that I've been filming for three days with multiple angles and I've slaved away, no views. But <laughs> you know, you come to yeah. accept that. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and you know, the, the, I think one of the challenges for us is that it, it, as Will was saying, you know, you cars with really interesting history, you can't convey uh, a, a car's fascinating history without going to some detail. And the problem is you, you sort of walk that fine line between producing a three minute film, which is a sort of a three minute documentary where somebody's talking very intelligently about the history of a car. Um, and, and, but, but of course, a lot of people don't have the attention span to, to sit down and listen to that. And so we're sort of constantly fighting with, well, we, we want to educate people because this is a really great story. People need to hear this. And, but actually balancing that with the fact that we know people kind of and the, well, that, but the, don't get turned on by watching that type of content. But that's why I think we've shifted and we've kind of moved towards working with people that want to tell a slightly different story and, yeah. and, and take a slightly different stance on it and make it slightly more appealing and, and 
less like this is a 1934 <laughs> Railton. Yeah. It was, you know, and yeah. you know that's been done, and and it has a limited shelf life on a platform like YouTube. Um, I, I want to ask you a couple of quick fire questions. Right? Okay, so sure. I just, you know, just very very quickly, uh, we'll rattle through them quickly. So, question we always ask all of the specialists at every auction without fail: one car in the auction, take home, which one? Challenge for Dolly. Okay. But actually, that's actually weird. <laughs> that is weird. Because it's That's your consignment, don't moan. <laughs> don't moan. Do you know what? That was such a guttural reaction because that is my default de facto. That's my all time favourite car. Even if it wasn't in this room, I would have said it. Um, in this room, I lie because there are, so, I mean, Enzo, 550 Barquetta, I mean, any of the EB 110s, like, but Chandra Radali is, is my all time okay. great. See, do you know what I like about that answer? He could have taken the shear on the home. Yeah. And then Please just all his audience. And then sell it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and bought 18 yeah. challenge good in point. every car. It's a very um, good point. Okay, worst car you've ever driven? Aston Martin DBX. Really? Oh, Aston Martin. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're not invited to the That's next That's so show. aggressive, <laughs> but I'm just going for it anyway. <laughs> Best car you've ever driven? Uh, maybe. Uh, 250 short wheelbase by GTO Engineering, so the... One of their re uh, recreations. Uh, re yes. I'm told don't mm. drive them in Italy. Uh, yes, as I said, maybe within this audience there'll be a few <laughs> original owners going, whoa, whoa, whoa. But for me, having not driven an original, nearly Very cool, climb. very, very cool. Um, best car event in the world? Monterey Car Week as a week. I think, okay. I think the quail within it is my favourite event of the week but the whole week. You've got to go from like Tuesday to Sunday. Okay. The whole week. Mm. Uh, best car location in the UK to film car for what you do. If you had your choice, right, so I'm going to do a video on that 27RS. Where are you going with that car? I am not a child of Brexit. I tend to be on the Eurotunnel more often than not. Um, but if I had to stay in this country, I go to Scotland more than Wales. Okay. So, so sc Scotland, probably. If I really want to go in, because it's quiet. We need quiet roads in Scotland's quiet. Yeah, we used to use, uh, at Autocar, we used to go to Crick Howell in Wales. Okay. Uh, good roads around there. Or we used to go to a, a location in, on the Yorkshire Moors okay. uh, where, uh, uh, but the trouble is with all these places, there's a lot of sheep. Okay, sheep. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. You, 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 you come over the crest of a hill. It's in, in the road. In, in a 996 it's not gonna RS, move. No. and there's a bloody sheep there. They're not quick. And they're move. looking right. at you Good thinking... Good brake test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> or actually, no, great for YouTube. Nearly, hit... <laughs> nearly killing a sheep in a well, XXX. Actually, another viral. quick fire question. Yeah. You've driven loads of cars. Worst moment in a car in terms of just brown trouser moment? Oh, there have definitely, definitely been a few. I'll go with the one that first came to my mind. Uh, I bought a Jaguar F-Type R, the first generation. Yes. 550 horsepower, rear wheel drive. Uh, about two days later, we drove down to the south of France. Uh, I was following a friend in a McLaren 675LT. I think we had a Lamborghini Gallardo with us. Fast cars, yeah. F-Type a little bit out of its depth. I was like, come on, we're gonna keep up. Uh, went around a corner and there was a car overtaking a tractor coming the other way on a mountain pass. I actually don't know how all three of us somehow got through. Did you sc scream a little yes. bit? Did yes. you stop the car? No, I, there and was go, a lot of, <gasps> lot of dirt great. and this and Everything stopped and afterwards I was like out of sport mode, into auto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so there have been plenty of others, but that, that probably sticks with me as being one of the worst. Yeah. Cool. Well, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for coming to our, our auction here in London. And uh, I, I don't know what the rest of your day or weekend <laughs> has in store, um, but um, are you, are you going to... Uh, we got the London's Brighton on Sunday. Yes, no, I'm not uh, quite yeah. going to manage that. Yeah, no, I, I, you don't want to be in Hyde Park <laughs> yeah, at 4am. Yeah, that, that I actually, actually did try and film it a few years ago and about three people watched. So uh, <laughs> and not only is it an exhausting event, it had no business sense. So I think instead I'll be uh, probably trying to explain to my wife how I bid on a challenge for that I couldn't afford. So <laughs> that's probably where we're going to end up. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, thanks a lot, Sam. We'll, really encourage, we'll you. encourage you to buy anything that you want here. Thank uh, you for having me. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Hello everyone, welcome back uh, to part two of RM Sotheby's car show. I'm going to talk a little bit about the market and uh, what's going on in here in London with chairman of RM Sotheby's in Europe, Mr. Peter Woolman, and car specialist Felix Archer. Gents, London auction, oldest annual sale in the European calendar, 16th, 16th year to 16th year? 16th year, yeah. 
new venue. What do you think? I love the venue, Peter. I love the fact that we've got this wonderful transparent roof on the marquee and we're looking at blue skies, and I'm not sure that's going to last. Um, but what's really nice for me is this setting of Marlborough House. As you said, this building was built in 1711. Uh, and as you say, for those that can't see it, it's right behind us. Uh, it's illuminated <laughs> at night. It looks beautiful. We've got a, a lineup of cars outside as well. Uh, it was built in 1711 for uh, Sarah Churchill, who was the Duchess of Marlborough. Uh, and it's now the home of the Commonwealth um, of Nations. So it's a historic building. It's in a historic part of London just around the corner from the Royal Automobile Club, with whom we partner for this event, uh, for the London to Brighton run, mm -hmm. which is being held on Sunday, and we're all doing, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, in the pouring rain. In the rain, exactly. And also, the, the other nice thing, well, I think the other great thing, doesn't uh, want to do it. <laughs> this <laughs> year, in this venue, the whole structure is all within this sort of square of St. James's, the Mall and Pall Mall. Yep. So right outside Marlborough House on Marlborough Road, outside St. James's Palace, where all the tourists are to go to watch the, uh, the lovely ceremonies that are regularly held there, I think most days of the week. We're going to have the Concours, 100 veteran cars in the London to Brighton Concours mm. uh, uh, as well. So that's all happening here in this, uh, in, yeah, in, it, in this vicinity. It's special. It is special. And and uh, I mean, it's funny. Yesterday when we were unloading the trucks with all the cars, big line of people with the cameras. You know, all all, all of the Instagrammers out in there photographing the supercars. It's got. It's been a really good atmosphere. And uh, we've got a cocktail reception happening fairly soon. Uh, if it feels like I'm talking rather quickly, it's because we've got a cocktail reception happening uh, very soon. And, and you um, need a drink. Uh, mm. and, and I haven't, <laughs> I'm start, I haven't started drinking yet. He's and lying, I, it starts I, in three I, hours. I, I like to have a head start yeah. for yeah, these It's parties. only nine o'clock. Really. I like, I like, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It's been a while since we've done a podcast, so it's, we've, got, we've gone through quite a long chunk of the summer, and some very significant sales have happened in that time. Not least, our North American colleagues put on uh, an astonishing Monterey sale. Uh, how many dollars of worth of cars did we sell in Monterey? In fact, I tell you something. I'm, we've, I've got that written 230, down. Two hundred thirty. Two hundred thirty-nine million dollars. Two hundred thirty-nine, and then there was also the sale of the. Uh, we can't talk about the price because that's the point of our sealed bid platform. But we sold the McLaren F1 as well that same weekend on the sealed bid platform. We did add into the overall total, although that part of it's secret. But, to, but even ignoring the McLaren F1, two hundred nearly two hundred and forty million dollars. Uh, that is an astonishing sum of money. And I, in the build-up to Monterey, we kept seeing these amazing cars coming in, big collections, uh, a lot, a lot of big collections in Monterey. And we're not talking about collections of hundred thousand dollar cars. We're talking about collections of multi, multi uh, million dollar cars. And and a really broad spread of stuff, so a lot of pre-war cars. And I think we were all sitting around going, wow, that's a lot of cars. Getting them into the sale is one thing. Getting that number of cars sold is something else. And as it was, what we sold 95% of those cars. I think that exceeded our expectations. So that's a really good sign, yeah? It's I think every, I think everyone will, will, you know, went into that sale with, uh, this stuff is amazing, this should all sell, but this is a lot of value to sell. Um, and we, were, we quickly, immediately on the Thursday night, got the answer, which is the money's out there and the passion's out there and everything flew. Um, so the market's in a really great place. Um, and obviously Monterey is a sort of Glastonbury of, the, of this car world that we operate in. Um, but it was extraordinary, it was just, Everything it, you, you could pick, you could pick any car in that catalogue, and it was special. Um, which actually takes us to this sale because I think every year we say, oh, "This is the best year ever. This is going to smash through the glass ceiling of what was possible." But genuinely, I do actually think that this is the best London lineup we've ever had. The best location. Everything has a great story. Uh, is special, rare in some way, and it's just fantastic. I think I think you're absolutely right, Felix. I mean, that was our biggest ever Monterey. Mm. This is all set to be our biggest ever London auction. But what particularly intrigued me in, in Monterey is we had three collections. Uh, one was quite heavy on pre-war cars, but we sold the Tulip Wood 
H6B Hispano Suiza, the 540K for fantastic money. Then we had a great selection of cars from the 1950s, sports racing cars, through to modern supercars, mm. you know, F40s, F50s, etc. Yeah. Mm. And what we saw is they all did well, mm. but in particular we noted that there was a, a real uplift in the modern supercar values as well, particularly things like F50s. They seem to have done really well. But it's not just our sale. I mean, this the point is in Monterey, it's Monterey Car Week. You've got the Concorde Elegance, you've got other auction houses putting on fantastic auctions. So whilst we still managed to sell over three days, $230 million sale. Yeah, well, but they, they were- they In were, total, it's more like half a yeah, billion dollars yeah, or $400 yeah, million. Yeah. Dollars. So that yeah. staggering amount of money invested into this, this, if you wish, hobby, this passion, this nostalgia. Yep. And that's really exciting. It really bodes well for what we've got coming up in the next 24 hours. I think the difference between um, uh, what happened in Monterey was like being in an internal flight in America where you land and everyone is a, is a, everything is an event uh, in that sort of in that tin can in the air um, and that's the energy that we want to replicate here yeah um, and what we have on display here that's going up for auction tomorrow is a lot of the greatest hits of what's been flying this year um, you know particularly the big five you know the f50 the f40 the 288 the LaFerrari the Enzo mm. all of those cars have been so hot this year. Um, and we've got the three incredible Group B cars. Um, there's a bit of everything here, which is why I think if you get no. the people in the room, um, we've got well, the product and that's what's really exciting. And also Felix, Monterey was comprised large a large percentage of the cars on offer were collections mm. and people like buying from collections yeah. there's something about collections they say if that's a great car then probably other cars in that person's collections are great cars yeah too. If, if, it's if discerning some, if somebody owns 10 amazing cars it's unlikely they're going to have one donkey yeah. you know yes. so uh, I, I, I get that completely and I think let's just You've both mentioned sort of Ferrari F cars uh, as being something that kind of uh, got onto another level in Monterey F40s, F50s. That is, let's just talk about that for a little bit um, because that is a really marked thing, isn't it? I mean, an F40, five minutes ago, it was a million. N n now, now, what are we thinking? You know, for a good F40, it's. We're two million, two million in that doubled. in that region. It's, you know, it, I mean, it, I mean, it hasn't doubled overnight, but you know what I mean. The, the the appreciation in that area of the market, F50s, you know, crazy, great. I mean, you know, so I, I think as well. I mean, you ha you have to factor in world events coming out of COVID. You know, the things that are going on, the less happy things that are going on in the world, and people still see motor cars, especially this type of motor car, as a great way to invest some money, enjoy that investment, your hard earned money, and I still think there's an attitude of it's, it does fly a bit in the face of traditional investment platforms which are more affected by world economic situations and other factors, but with this, whether your car goes up in value or not, in the time you've owned it, you've had the enjoyment of ownership of that car. And some good examples here are, you know, the Enzo mm. that we've got in the sale, uh, that's part of the Gran Turismo collection. That's been one owner from new, and I think it's done, what, 70,000 yeah. odd, odd? I mean, yeah, bonkers. You know, and it's great to see, that is great love it. They, You know, there's something really, there's, uh, I don't know. It's been it, enjoyed. We have been recording two podcasts uh, today, um, and uh, I was chatting. Which one's your um, favorite so far? Favorite podcast? Yeah, mm. which one of the two? Oh, oh, the previous one. Right, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm only I'm only here with you two because you know <laughs> I ran out of options. But uh, 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 how, but how can we improve? It no. <laughs> I was chat I was chatting to uh, Sam Hancock, well-known historic racer. But but part of that conversation, we were talking about the role of events in underpinning. He, Sam was talking about why certain race cars are becoming. Uh, you know they're in demand because there are great events that support the racing of those types of cars and we all know that to be true um, and uh, the London to Brighton is uh, the oldest car event in the world isn't it uh, it's a phenomenal event ancient cars and here we are in 2022 and you look at a veteran car and it, you you know for a lot of people um, you can't really relate to it. You know, it looks like an old horse-drawn carriage without the horses, and, and indeed some of them are, aren't they? Effectively that. Um, but people still love doing it. And, you know, the market for veteran cars is 
in no small part underpinned by the London's Brighton Veteran Run, and that's why those a lot of those cars are are so in demand. You look you look down the list of entrants for Sunday's Run, and it's a who's who of car collecting, or museum owners. You know, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, the people that still enjoy the dawn of motoring, yeah. and I think the R Royal Automobile Club's input into that is also you know it's high energy. There's, this is London Motor Week. We talked before about Monterey. That's kind of Car Week, Pebble Beach, and all the different things happening. Mm. The other auctions kind of achieving that in, in, in no small part here. Mm. Very different, but we are achieving that in, in just the same way. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I also think there is, there is genuinely uh, little comparison to driving one of those things on an A road in terms of visceral driving. It's sort of like you've got fear, you've yeah. got, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got trepidation. Yeah. It's, yeah. But it's such an enjoyable event because everyone is willing their car to the end. They've got the camaraderie of everyone in their car and at the end of the day, there's a, there's a wall of people cheering you on and it's an incredible celebration of that age of car. I think, I think you get fewer flies in your teeth driving these, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they focus on the uh, headlights. Yeah. I, first year I ever did the London Brighton. 60 miles, Hyde Park to Madeira Drive in Brighton, 60 miles, took me eight hours. Yeah. Eight That's hours. That's not a good advert. <laughs> But there was a lot of driver error involved in that, and, and there was a little, a little bit of mechanical. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, you say that some of the bigger cars is three hours, and that, you know not, oh, yeah, not, not yeah. much more, and that, you know, they are driving in among modern traffic, mm. yep. which is no mean feat as well, considering most of them don't really have brakes that you could uh, rely on very heavily. Well, the last podcast. Uh, uh, I recorded was with you Peter and we went out to Stuttgart and we had a look around the museum. Now our, our friends from Mercedes, they're here in London and they're taking part in the run and they brought their simplex over. Uh, that is over 30 horsepower that yeah, car isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, but they'll be there in sort of 45 minutes. That will get to Brighton as fast as you'd get there in a Carrera 2 mm. probably. You know really it's, it just storms down there. Mm. So um, I, I think what's fun about it as well just moving a little bit away just from the cars it's the carnival when you turn up at Hyde Park and you know on Sunday morning wind rain whatever it might be doing the spectators early in the morning it's still dark people are warming up their cars but it's also the way they're dressed and interesting I've got to think about what I'm going to wear on Sunday and when I know you do, that's unless good. you wear motorcycle kit to keep you dry you're not keeping in period actually the things that you would wear that to keep you dry are no, not that different to what you would have worn in 1903. I remember um, doing the run with you and you turned up in white cashmere. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. And I, 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 you know, I looked at Peter and I thought, white cashmere? It's London to Brighton. If you remember, right? Peter, there was a nod, it was a nod to the white tyres that we have oh, on the Cadillac. Is that what it was? Yeah, I thought it was a bit of a Tony Curtis look. You had, you had an oil <laughs> smudge on your sleeve in the first 10 minutes, you know. But um, no, I, it, I think it's going to be raining this Sunday as it happens. And I am in quite a pedestrian car and I'm thinking, well, if it's raining heavily, I'm going to. Does it have a screen? <laughs> Does it have a screen? Barely has a steering wheel. Felix. It <laughs> no, it doesn't have a. Sc it doesn't have a screen. I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be brilliant. And uh, yeah, been, been lent that. It's a 1900 Daimler, and it was the very first car to be imported into South Africa. This is such first date chat, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't <laughs> had one of those for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my first dates are pretty yeah, yeah. brief. It's a 1900 Daimler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not impressed? No. no. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, moving on then. One less person would have to buy a drink. Yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, Felix is getting bored. Let's move the conversation on. Why don't we just talk a little bit specifically about this sale and what's on offer and some of the, uh, the you know, the, the, this amazing collection that's sort of right behind where we're sitting at the moment and some of the other cars we've, we've, we've got in the room. Um, so, we have the Gran Turismo collection. Uh, phenomenal, right? I mean, it, it's where else have you seen a collection of, let's call them sort of predominantly modern era supercars? When have you lost? When did you last see a collection like this come to market? I can't. It's never happened. I think it's. It? I think it's rare to see something of this sort of strength and consistency, and and also value. Um, every single car is very interesting in some way, be it the. Enzo being super high mileage, and to me that's a great selling point. It's an Enzo you can actually use. There's an, you know, there's a, there's an interest in super low mileage delivery, all original paint cars. 
that's a different thing. But you can't use those cars. There is, you know, the fundamentals of, your, of most people's car passion is they want to drive. Um, and this is one you can go and drive. Um, I think to that point, Felix, when um, collectors of model cars, dinky toys, lots of things, books, records, traditionally, the price point's different here mm. than a dinky toy, but people would buy one to play with and one to keep in its box as for a collector's yeah, item. Exactly. And that's fair, even with vinyl records, things mm. like that, you, you, you keep it absolutely brand I never new. did that. I wrecked all of my toys. Well, I know, well, you continue to do so. <laughs> He's wrecking the podcast as well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I was doing something wrong. I've wrecked all my toys. Uh, but no, you're, yeah, yeah, you're right. And, and actually, I mean, and Felix, uh, one of your cars in the sale, the, two, the, the orange 2.7 RS Porsche behind us, not part of the GT collection. But one of the nice things about that, that's an, that, that car's a driver, isn't it? It's done 270,000 kilometres. Yeah. So someone's got to be the first person to take that to 500,000. Yeah. How many cars out there in the world that yep. are collectible cars that have done that level and, of mileage. And oh, the Cushway 300 SL that we recently sold, funny enough. So this is a plug, yep. yeah. <laughs> sold. So, great, great selection of cars. Uh, you can have one car from this entire marquee, or indeed parked outside the marquee. What are you having? Uh, do you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, blow my own trumpet and say the 2.7 RS. Surprise. I know it's a kind of a boring answer, but. What about you, Mr. I can't pick one. It's going to be the F40, because I've uh, of that era of supercar, I've always felt that the F40, to me, still looks modern, visceral, but there's enough horsepower to scare yourself, but not so much that you can't extend it a little bit. Um, and the uh, the green Mirror SV. Yeah, I've that's always lovely. I've always loved Mirrors. It's, it's fabulous in color. that colour. You know, it's the ultimate specification for a Mirror. And, you know, as a... An owner of um, an E-Type Coupe, which I think is one of the most beautiful cars in the world, I definitely think the Mura is up there with yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you everyone for joining us on the RM Sotheby's Car Show here from our marquee at Marlborough House uh, for our London auction. Hope you've enjoyed the conversation with Sam, it's been fascinating. If you want to listen to the extended conversation, and I highly recommend that you do, please go and download our podcast from all of the usual places where you get your podcasts. So uh, join us again next time. Thank you.